of Romans chapter number 12, and uh, I love these Christmas songs, the Christmas decorations, and uh, I love preaching on Christmas, and for the next few weeks in Sunday school and at the 11 o'clock service, that's what our focus will be, but on Wednesday nights, we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans, and uh, I want to remind us that the theme of the book of Romans is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again, and that story is what can change lives. There are people this Christmas season who need to hear that story from us. And uh, if we take away all the decorations, we take away all the, the uh, presents and all the food, I don't want to do that. I like all those things. But if we do take all those things away, we still have Christmas because we have Jesus Christ. And so that's the theme of the book of Romans. Here in Romans chapter 12, last week we saw the focus was on the body of Christ and how that as a church we have different members in that one body. Notice uh, chapter 12, uh, look at verse 3. It says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Uh, Paul is preparing the, the reader for the next words that he's going to say. Each one of us believe, and, and we're right, in one aspect, we believe that the gifts we bring to the body of Christ are important. We believe that the job we have to do is an important job, and we're right. But what we can tend to do if we're not careful is we can devalue the job somebody else does for the cause of Christ. We can uh, maybe not focus on what they bring to the table. But what God's Word teaches is that we need to learn to appreciate the differences even in the body of Christ. And that's where he begins in verse 4. He says, For as we have many members in one body... And all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Our bodies are made up of different members. We're not all one hand. We're not one big eyeball. We're not one big foot. We have all sorts of different parts. We have hands and eyes and a nose and ears and different parts that do different things. And that's the way a church is. A church is so important uh, for each member to be doing their work for the cause of Jesus Christ. And here he says, verse 5, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And then he focuses on the gifts that God has given to each one of us. Now every person has been given gifts by the Lord. And those gifts are to be used. They can be used, yes, for your family. But those gifts are to be used for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now there, you may look through this list, and, and I know there's some people who say, Well, I don't have any gifts. Well, that's not true. As a Christian, we all have gifts. As a Christian, we all have things that God has given us that we're naturally good at. And we ought to be using those things for the cause of Christ. But let me say this. Just because we have certain gifts does not excuse us from working on the things that don't come as easily to us. Let's read through these and, and just look at them again. Verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy... Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Some people are good at preaching or at proclaiming the Word of God. But let me ask a question. How many of us are supposed to proclaim the Word of God? All of us are. So while some folks, that might be their gift, and they're to use that gift in the work of Christ, we're all to preach. We're all to maybe not stand behind a pulpit, but we're all to tell folks about Jesus Christ. So uh, just because it's not our gift or our forte doesn't mean it isn't something we shouldn't Work on. So notice he says, whether prophecy, let us pref prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Some people are just natural servants. They see a need, they take the lead. They see something in the church that's a mess, needs to be cleaned up. They don't look around for somebody else to do it. They just go, hey, I'm going to do that. Uh, they see somebody needing help carrying something. They just automatically go over and take over helping. Uh, they, they see somebody bearing a burden and they just want to help. They want to serve. Some people are naturally good at ministry. Now, does that excuse the rest of us from ministering? No. The Bible says that all of us are to have the same mind as Jesus Christ. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Notice the next one, verse 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Some people are naturally good at teaching. They can take a complex subject, something that is complex, and they can make it so simple that the youngest child can understand it. That, that's what a teacher is to do. And some people are just naturally good at that. But all of us 
are to work at teaching others the word of God. Notice next, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Ex- exhorting literally means lifting up or bringing comfort to people. Hebrews 10.25 says that's one of the major purposes of the church is to exhort one another, to comfort people, to lift up people. Some of us might be naturally good at it, but we're all to do it. Notice next, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Some people are gifted financially. They have business minds. They're very good with finances. They can stretch George Washington until he screams. They're just good at money, and they can give. Now, all of us, though, are supposed to honor God with our substance. And with our finances, notice next, he that ruleth with diligence, where to those who some people are good at administration, they're good at taking things and organizing those things. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, some people are naturally merciful. But what I want us to see in all of these is regardless of what our gifts are, we're to work at all of these things. Now let's turn to one more passage before we continue this week. Go now to First Corinthians twelve again. We looked at this briefly last week. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks a lot about the body of Christ and how that there are such differences in all of us in the gifts that we have to bring to the work of Christ. But what we need to realize about all gifts is that the gifts by themselves are not enough. Notice what it says, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 26. The Bible says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. If there's somebody in church who is uh, experiencing a victory, you know what we ought to do? No matter what we're going through personally, we ought to share that victory with them. We ought to rejoice with them. If somebody's bearing a burden, even if we're not going through a burden or a deep valley at that time, you know what we're to do? We're to go through that burden with them. We're to suffer together. We're to rejoice together, just like your body. Your whole body rejoices. If your team wins, you don't just go, woohoo. Your whole body goes, yeah, your whole body rejoices, and you get excited. My team won. That's what I do anyway. When my Lions are in first place, I mean, it's a miracle season. It's incredible. The Cubs won the World Series. The Lions are in first place. I don't know what else is going to happen next. I really don't. But the fact is that your whole body rejoices. You get excited about things. Or your whole body grieves. You hit your thumb with a hammer. When you hit your thumb with a hammer, I was pounding some tacks in, putting plastic up over the glass doors this week, getting ready for that cold air coming tonight. I'm going to be here tomorrow. And there was a couple times I gave my, my thumb a good hammering too. Boom, just a, not, not a real good one this time, thank, thank the Lord. But I did catch it a couple times. Boy, but if you ever really just catch your thumb with that hammer, what do you do? You don't just go, ow. No, you go, ah. Your face contorts, your thumb gets hurt, your hands hurt, your whole body wrenches together. Why? Because your body's connected. And it's the same with the church. Uh, Regardless, verse 26, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and then it talks about the gifts that God has given. But then look at verse 31. It says, but covet earnestly... The best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He said, listen, these gifts are wonderful, and you should use them in the cause of Christ. But if all you have are those gifts, you've missed the boat. You've missed the point. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about the missing element that we all should have. And what is that? It's charity. What's charity? That's God's kind of love. If you exercise these gifts without God's love in your heart, without, without working with God's kind of love, and 1 Corinthians 13 describes what it is then all those gifts are null and void. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me Nothing. And then look at the very end of 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 13. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity, God's kind of love. What is God's kind of love? It's a love that loves regardless of whether that love is returned. God loved us when we were still sinners. While we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. We didn't have anything good to offer God. We're just lost sinners, but Jesus loved us. That's charity. And we are to have charity as we operate our gifts. Look at Romans chapter 12, and we'll continue where we left off 
uh, last week. Romans chapter 12, let's begin verse number 9. Boy, there's just a lot of different truths all in this passage, and we're going to get through as many as we can tonight. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit as I preach your word. God, speak and minister your word to our hearts. Give us what we need tonight. Lord, you know the burdens in this room. Lord, you know the folks who are ill, the folks who couldn't be here, that wanted to be here tonight. We just ask you to put a hedge about them, bless them, raise them up, Lord. And Lord, just speak to our hearts through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We just saw these gifts and how these gifts are so important, but these gifts are to be operated in love. Now, notice the very next verse, what he says here in Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Here's the bottom line what he's saying. Don't be a phony. Don't be a fraud. Don't be a fake. Don't pretend to like people. Don't pretend to love people. Don't just use uh, uh, words but don't have any meaning behind them. No, he said, listen, in the body of Christ, we are to love, and our love should be without dissimulation. We should be uh, uh, Christians with a sincere love for one another. Now, uh, some people say, well, I love so-and-so, but I don't like so-and-so. Well, you know, there, there's, I guess there's a little bit to that. Sometimes we don't like each other if we get on each other's nerves. How many have somebody you love, but they get on your nerves and you get on theirs sometimes? Let me see. Okay, so there are times we may not like somebody or what they're doing, but nonetheless, we ought to be real. We ought, we ought to let our love be without dissimulation. Don't be a phony. Don't be a fake. Love sincerely. Look at verse 9. And this is, by the way, one of the characteristics of love. And you find it in 1 Corinthians 13. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. If you truly love people, you're going to hate some things. Now, don't miss this. This is so important. If you truly love people, you're going to hate that which destroys people. People say, well, uh, well that, that's not very loving to preach a hard message against alcohol. That's the most loving thing you could do for a drunkard. Most loving thing you could do. Uh, boy, it's not, very, it's not very loving to preach hard against the whole same-sex marriage movement that's going on right now. Folks, that's the most loving thing you could do for somebody who's entrapped in that lifestyle. Somebody who truly loves is going to risk losing your favor to tell you the truth. Think back in your life to the people who've made the most impact in your life. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it was a coach or a pastor or a teacher. No doubt at some point that person confronted you about something. Somehow, some way, they told you the truth. Maybe some hard things you didn't want to hear. But they risked losing your favor because they were a true friend to you. The Bible says the wounds of a friend are faithful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Uh, be careful about somebody who just tells you everything you want to hear all the time. Be careful about that. The Bible says to let our love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Hate that which is evil. Hate the things that will destroy a person. But notice next, cleave to that which is good. Notice it's two-sided. It's just like when we looked at sanctification. Sanctification isn't just a big list of things we don't do. Sanctification is I'm separated from the world, but it also means I'm separated unto God. Uh, loving uh, with being without dissimulation doesn't just mean I hate bad stuff, but it also means I cleave to that which is good. It means I love the good stuff. It means I love the Bible. I love people. I love souls. I love church. I love prayer. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Learn to hate sin. God's people are to hate sin. We're not to tolerate sin. We're to hate it. We're to uh, shun it. We don't want to be a part of sin. Keep your finger here. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Again, the charity chapter, the love chapter. Notice one of the characteristics of charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Notice what verse uh, 5 says. It says, doth not about charity. It says, it doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. It stays away from evil, and it stays away from unseemly things or twisted things. Uh, we, we need to be careful about uh, getting used to sin. I've told you the story before about uh, the snake handler, the, the woman named Grace, who used to train king cobras. She'd get the king cobras, and, of course, the king cobra is different from a rattlesnake. A rattlesnake's teeth are like on a hinge, and they can send their, their teeth out like this, and they can stab with their teeth. Well, king cobra's teeth are like ours. They're within their mouth, just like ours are. 
And a king cobra, while it is somewhat fast, it's a, a, a person with average reflexes could escape a king cobra's bite. But what this lady would do is she would get these king cobras and she'd begin stroking their, their uh, top of their head behind their hood. He, she'd be stroking their hood and they'd be striking at her and she'd take one hand, she'd be going like this, with the other hand she'd be bumping their mouth every time they'd try to bite her. Well, eventually she'd wear the cobra out and she would tame them. In fact, uh, she worked at a few zoos and got fired because the people were so nervous about the way she handled the snakes. But she said, oh, they're, don't worry. I mean, they're, they're perfectly harmless. But folks, a snake's a snake. I mean, a poisonous snake's a poisonous snake. No matter how well you think you have it tamed, it's poisonous and it'll kill you. Well, one day she, somebody wanted to see her technique and they came in to photograph her. And when they did, they took a picture and the flash went off and it startled her and she didn't have her glasses and wasn't as focused as she should have been. And that snake bit her and within a couple hours she was dead. What happened? She got, she got comfortable around a dangerous creature. You know, that's what happens with sin if you're not careful. You can't get comfortable with sin. In fact, don't even learn about sin. The Bible says that we're to be ignorant about sin. If there, and what I mean by that is uh, we're, we're to be uh, ignorant regarding evil. There's just some things that's good just not to know about. I mean, there's just some things you don't need to know. Just stay away from sin. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Go back to Romans 12, verse 10. Notice what it says next. Not just to love and be real in your love, but look at verse 10. It says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Well, I love so-and-so, but I don't like them, so I'm going to treat them bad. Right here, that throws that out the window. God said, listen, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Notice the word brotherly. You know, when we got saved, we became children of God. Look at 1 John chapter 3. Let's go there for a minute. Some of my favorite verses in the Bible. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Notice what it says. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We are sons of God. We're children of God. That makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. We call each other brother, brother so-and-so. I don't know if we say sister so-and-so as much, but we'll, sometimes when somebody first comes to church, they're like, Brothers, are they your brother? What, what does that mean, brother so-and-so? The truth is we're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you, let, let's say for a minute you were a twin. You were a twin. You've heard people say you have to be twins to have more fun. But let's say you were a twin. And you're born again, but your twin was lost. You're saved, but your twin is unsaved. And there sitting next to you is a brother in Christ from Africa. Somebody who's been born again, who got saved by a missionary going there and leading them to Christ. Did you know this person is actually more of a brother to you than that twin is? Did you know you actually have more in common with this person than you do with that flesh and blood brother? Why? Because spiritual, the spiritual bond goes much deeper. We're bound by Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We belong in His family. Because of that, verse 10 says, We are to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another, giving one another preferential treatment. Look at Philippians chapter 2. We're, we're, to, we're to think about other people, our brothers and sisters in Christ ahead of us. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse 1. The Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. There's no room for envy or, or bitterness in the family of God. We're not to do anything through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, notice, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now that fi flies in the f face, I'll get it out, that flies in the face of our human tendencies, our human nature. Our human nature says, I'm number one. I worry about me and 
I esteem myself better than others. That's what human nature says. But Christ's Christ's nature says that in lowliness of mind, we're to esteem other better than ourselves. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. The story of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. They were going to go, uh, they, they had a convention, and he was too ill to attend. And they wanted a message from the founder of the Salvation Army to give to the delegates. And he sent back a one-word reply, and that word was others. Others. That's what the gospel is about. It's about others. That's what the Christian life is about, is about others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Scripture tells us, Romans 12 here, that our love is to be without dissimulation, we're to abhor that which is evil, we're to cleave to that which is good, we're to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Look at verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord. When we hear the word business, we think of numbers. We think of finances. We think of, of uh, the money side of things. When the Bible is talking about business, it's talking about the zeal, the earnestness, the eagerness, the haste, the busyness. Literally, that's the root of that word, busyness. Uh, we're, not, we're, we're to realize there's an urgency about our work is what it's saying. Uh, we can't have this attitude that says, well, hey, praise the Lord. We used to meet in folding metal chairs down in a... Uh, 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 fellowship hall, but now we've got padded pews. Well, this is great. Let's just relax and take it easy. We're comfortable now. Hey, uh, we used to have to set up and tear down three times a week because we shared with the Girl Scouts, but look, we've got a building now. Let's just sit back and take it easy. Hey, we had some people saved a year or two ago. I mean, that's pretty good. A lot of churches don't have that. Folks, we are not to let off the gas pedal at all. We're to keep pressing forward until Jesus comes. We're to, we're to keep reaching out. We need to be starting more buses and more Sunday school. And I, I know we need to take care of what we have now. I get that. But I also get that we need to continue to push forward to reach more and more people for Jesus Christ. The Lord didn't bless us with a building like this just to take it easy. He blessed us with a building like this to occupy until Jesus comes. And we're to verse 11. It says, not be slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, literally having a fire about us, serving the Lord. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope. The Bible talks about hope. It doesn't mean a Christian crosses his fingers and goes, boy, I hope things will work out. The hope in the Bible for a Christian is an expectancy. We know we can trust the promises of God. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. When you go through a tough time, let, God, let patience have its perfect work in you. Verse 12, continuing instant in prayer. You know what that word instant in prayer means? Uh, what, what that phrase means? How many of you... How many of you well, I better let me think here. Yeah. How many of you like homemade mashed potatoes? Let me see. Like them? How many of you like them with lumps in them? I like them either way. I, I like, you can make them lumpy. You can make them creamy. You can make them cheesy. I don't care. I love them. But guess what? I am a little bit weird. I actually like the instant kind, too. I like the kind because they are kind of real potatoes. They're like potato flakes, I think. Do they come from real potatoes? I've heard they do. But uh, I like those, too. You know, I mean, they're a little bit easier. I'd rather have the homemade mashed up kind with the lumps and the, you know, it's really good too with sour cream in it. You ever had it with sour cream and cheese? It's really good that way. But uh, but I can eat it both ways. I can have instant potatoes. You know, the, the beauty about instant potatoes, you just add a little bit of stuff, you throw it in the microwave and you've got potatoes, right? Well, the Bible says we're to be instant in prayer. I mean, that that's what we're to do. It should be a reflex. Prayer should be a reflex. You go to the doctor, and the doctor takes that little, I forget what it's called. What's that little thing called? It's a rubber hammer, but there's a, there's a fancy medical name for it. I forget, but it's a rub, rubber hammer is what it is. But he gets paid more to call it that fancy name. See, that's how it works. But what does he do? He, he has you sit on the edge of that little bench thing with the wax paper, and he takes that rubber hammer, and he goes, well, you want me to hit you back, doctor? He hits you in the knee, and he wants to see your knee go, whoop, whoop. What's he checking? Your reflexes. What happens when that nerve gets hit? What do you do? Well, what should happen when 
tribulation comes. Here comes tribulation. Here comes the hammer. Hits you. Right in the heart. What should your reflex be? Prayer. Instant in prayer. Unfortunately for some of us, our reflex is complaining. Well, God, how come you let this happen again? For some of us, our reflex is worry. Oh, I know God's got me through all these other things, but I don't know if he can handle this one. For some of us, that's our, our, our reflex. What is our reflex supposed to be? We're to be what? We're to be instant in prayer. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The scripture says, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. When God pulls out that rubber hammer and there's a tribulation in our lives, you know what he wants us to be? Instant in prayer. Instant. I mean, immediately going to, to the Lord. There's one of those songs we're singing for the Christmas musical. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh, Lord, I need you. When the wind is blowing strong. We want to be instant in prayer about everything. Pray, the Bible says, about everything. Verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. If God shows you a need and you have the opportunity to meet that need, you should meet the need. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, Don't say to your neighbor, Go and come again, and I will give to thee when you have it with you. If there's something you can do for somebody, God's shown it to you, you do it for them. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Given to hospitality. The Bible says, Thereby some have entertained strangers unawares. I mean, just, just having an open heart, an open home, an open table to, to people. Uh, how many of you know somebody like that? You just know, boy, if I showed up there, they'd invite me in. and I could ho Hospitality. God's word says we're to be hospitable people. Verse 14. Bless them which curse you, which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Keep your finger here and let's turn over to the book of Matthew, please. Well, there's just so much good stuff. And we need to put it all into practice here in the book of Romans. Look at Matthew. Chapter number 5. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 5, verse 43. He says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. You know, that's the real test right there. It's hard to keep praying for somebody that you wish ill towards. Just put into practice what the Lord said. There's somebody who, who's done you wrong. There's somebody who gives you trouble. You put it into practice. You start praying for them. And no, not, God, please kill them. No, that's not the prayer for them. No, praying for them. Praying sincerely for their blessing. Praying for their spiritual growth. Praying for God to, to uh, work in their lives. Do what Jesus said. Bless them. Love them. Pray for them. Notice, which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Is he saying so that you'll be saved? He's saying no, but that you'll be like your father. You know, you'll take on more of his characteristics. Notice verse 45. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain, which is a good thing, which is a blessing. Everybody who grew up in the country can say amen. The rain is a good thing. Sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God doesn't just say, boy, well, these people serve me, so I'm going to send them sunshine and good food and rain. No, he gives it to everybody. Verse 46, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I'll be done with this. We went to a youth conference, oh, about five years ago up in northern Indiana. I guess maybe, maybe longer, six or seven now. And uh, there was a man at the youth conference named Masab Hassan Youssef. Masab Hassan Youssef is the, found, is the son of one of the founders of Hamas. Hamas is a Palestinian terrorist organization, an organization that would love nothing more than to see the nation of Israel destroyed and wiped off the map. And this man, Masab Hassan Youssef, I got the privilege to meet him, to shake his hand. He's now a brother in Christ. He's saved now. And uh, he told his story. He gave his testimony. In fact, I got to get his book and got, got to get him to sign it and, and uh, meet him and talk to him just briefly. But it, it was a, a neat thing. 
But here was his testimony. Uh, he was over uh, in Europe. He's from the Middle East, but he was over in Europe. And while he was over there, there was a Westerner. He didn't say what country, but they were inviting people to Bible study. They were giving out flyers for Bible study. Well, he took one of the flyers and he looked at it and he said, you know what? In his mind, he thought, I'm going to go to this Bible study for more ammunition. Now, as a terrorist, he didn't mean bullets and grenades. What he meant was, I'm going to go see just how silly these Christians really are. I'm going to go to learn what they're about because I know they're foolish anyway. So he went to that Bible study. Well, that night, guess what chapter they were studying? They were studying these verses we just read. They were studying these verses where it says, Thou shalt love, ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. He heard those three words and he couldn't shake those three words. The Holy Spirit of God used those three words, Love your enemies. And he got thinking. He said, You know what? In where I'm from, we hate our brother. Where I'm from, we betray our brother. Where I'm from, we kill our brother. And here's this man, Jesus. He didn't understand who he was yet. Here's this man, Jesus, telling us to love our enemies. Those words chased him for six years, and he ended up getting saved, and he came to Christ. He's on political asylum over here in the U.S. You know, it's no great feat, as this says, to love people that love you. I mean, that's a great thing to have people love you. There's no challenge in loving them back. The challenge and the time when God's character is really shown is when we go through a difficulty, we go through a trial, somebody hasn't treated us right, but yet we treat them the way Jesus would. That's when we have more power in our testimony. Let's bow our heads together, please. Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky, and I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.